Okay, well, um, thanks very much, Siraj, for the, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to, to make a presentation through as part of this Climate Resilience Programme webinar series. As you've already said, we're going to talk about characterising and adapting to climate risks in the UK wine sector. You've already given us a nice introduction, so I'm not going to say very much more about that, but just to, to emphasize the fact that we're joined by Alistair Nesbitt and, and Francis Trappi, who work with a small advisory company called Vinescapes, and they're going to give us, uh, uh, at, at the end of the presentation, a perspective from the, from the sector. Um, we've very much worked together on this as, as, a, as a team, and this is a collective presentation. I'm going to give a quick overview of context to the, to the research project and uh, the structure of the presentation, and then I'll hand over to the, to the co-speakers. So one of the things that we want to get across just is the fact that this is extremely timely work. The UK wine sector is, is growing very fast. There was about a thousand hectares of vines planted in 2007 and that's increased to over 3,500 as of 2019. Of course grape growing is highly sensitive to climate, it requires a reliable minimum growing season temperature and it's also greatly affected by variability in weather conditions, extreme events and, and, and such like. So climate change represents both a, an opportunity and a risk. On the whole, warming is beneficial in, in the UK, and we're confident that the warming we've already experienced is going to continue in the future. However, weather events such as frost and, and other extremes, and the way that they change in the future could be a threat to reliable production. And indeed, the importance of specific climate and weather conditions makes it necessary to produce highly bespoke climate information for the sector. We also have very nice research opportunity. We have the new projections for, from the UK Met Office, the future climate projections. We have an opportunity to study adaptation in an emergent private sector operation. We can ask questions about how the sector perceives climate change, to what extent it's considering climate change in its decision-making processes. There are uh, many long-lived decisions in, in wine growing, in viticulture. So vines planted now will be still producing in the next 30 years by the, by the 2050s and therefore exposed to potentially quite different climatic conditions and characteristics. So it's important to consider it in making decisions about what varieties to plant now. And then finally, we want to uh, highlight the fact that there was a, a bumper harvest associated with uh, the hot, dry summer in 2018. Really very major uh, improvements and uh, increases in production associated with that. And we can ask the question in terms of our studying of adaptation uh, about the way in which this extreme event has changed perceptions within the sector and uh, whether it has indeed changed any behavior within the, in the sector. So I'm gonna finish there and, and hand over to my colleagues. Steve Dawling is going to speak next and he's gonna give some a bit more background about wine and climate and then some of the results from the climate projections. He'll hand over to Kate Gannon who will run through our insights and emerging findings from the adaptation work. Then we'll hand over to Alistair and to Francis to give a, a perspective from the from the sector. So Steve, over to you. Well, thank you, Declan, and thank you everybody for joining the webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna focus on climatological data analysis associated with viticulture. Um, I'm gonna look back at some historical records and I'm gonna look forward in terms of the projections, but I, I like to start with um, this particular slide and this map which um, always amazes me, even though I've seen it many times. It's a map that shows in general terms, the regions of the world which are actually active in wine production. And it always amazes me to see just how uh, restricted actually the, the area of land is that is involved in uh, wine production. And I guess that's a trigger for making us think initially about what the climatological conditions need to be for a thriving industry. Clearly, 
um, those conditions are quite constraining because the area of land involved is, is really relatively small. And of course, the area of suitable land is changing under climate change. And so new regions like the UK uh, are seeing an opportunity, um, while other regions of the world that have been producing wine for a long time uh, are seeing greater and greater risks and are needing to adapt or to, to, to face uh, realities of, of, of perhaps finding it difficult to maintain the sort of production they have in the past. Now on the right hand side of this slide, um, this is something that uh, we're going to return to time and again I think in this uh, presentation. We've got a, a schematic here which shows um, different varietals of, of vines and, and grapes um, and as you look down the diagram there you'll recognize the names of some uh, wine options of course. Um, what you'll notice is that each of these varietals has a suitable temperature range in which they thrive and, and in which they ripen successfully. Um, and so I just want to point out something to um, hold the thought is that you'll see here that the temperature of about 14 Celsius is where we begin as a growing season temperature on average to, to see successful growing of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, for example. And so keep that in mind as we go forward and, and, and look at some of the climate data related to this. 14 is a something of a holy grail, let's say, for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Next slide, please, Dick. Um, let's give a little bit of context. Uh, Declan mentioned how the growth of the industry is going, and this slide actually quantifies that, I hope, quite nicely. The solid line is uh, giving us the record of the number of vineyards in the UK, while the uh, grey bars are showing us total hectareage. And one thing that's very noticeable from this slide is that actually one only has to look back about 20 years to the early noughties um, to see actually the number of vineyards declining. And it's only since about 2003 that actually we've begun to see this growth in the industry. And I think that that's a story of a couple of things. Uh, one thing to consider is, are we growing the right varieties that are associated and suited to the climate that we're experiencing? And then uh, the other thing is, what is the impact of the trend in climate on all of that? And uh, we would argue, I think, that in the first half of that graph, the, the left-hand half of that graph, um, matching varieties to climate was a real struggle and the industry was finding it very hard uh, to do that, but also to market the varieties that were being grown because they weren't necessarily um, particularly popular ones that were easily easy to market. And then since 2003, you might remember the very warm year, the very warm summer of 2003, we've seen this growth and uh, later on I'll show you some data which quantifies the, uh, how the climate has been becoming more suited to uh, wine production over time. Even so, there are still threats. And so, for example, the summer of 2007 wasn't a great one. That was a very wet one and also 2012. So it's a mixture of climate trend over long period and extreme events, some of which are positive and some of which are negative. Next slide, please, Declan. So just a little bit more context, um, uh, you'll see on the left hand side here how the hectare associated with viticulture is divided up across the country. You'll see at the moment that it, there is a quite a dominance of um, viticulture location in the southeast of England. But of course, that is changing over time as the climate changes. And I'll show you some output later on, which helps to demonstrate how other regions of, the, of, of Great Britain are becoming more and more suited to quality wine production. And the other thing to keep in mind on the right hand side here is that the industry is targeting a very significant growth, as we've already seen in the vineyard numbers, um, producing about six million bottles of wine in 2018 and targeting a growth to, to 40 million bottles by 2040. And that's not an unrealistic uh, ambition, um, as you'll see on this schematic, because if we take the um, state of Oregon in the USA as some kind of model, 
for a similar sized area of production, then we, we might expect to be able to follow in Oregon's footsteps in that regard. So that's a great story about opportunity and of the growth of a particular economic sector. Next slide, please. Now, published data on the climate side is, of course, generally available. And I'm showing you a table here of one other type of um, metric or bioclimatic ind index, growing degree days. So here's some data published by Kendernet et Kendernet from 2019. And uh, this is from the State of the UK Climate Report, of course, showing how over time growing degree days annually have been increasing quite dramatically. And then uh, we can see data here from different averaging periods. Um, uh, for example, 1981 to 2010, you can see in the UK, 1610 growing degree days, and that has increased to 1695 by 2009 to 2018. And of course, Declan mentioned earlier the, uh, uh, the bumper year of 2018 for, for viticulture. Just look at those values, 1807 averaged over the whole UK. So you can see the growing environment changing quite dramatically in a positive way for viticultural production. Next slide. Now, if we zoom in a bit and think about that region of Southeast England, which we said is particularly suited to wine production, then this graph um, helps us see uh, in a little more detail on a regional basis, how those conditions have become more suited. So the graph is showing us over a hundred years, the growing season temperature for Southeast and South Central England. And the green line, the horizontal line is that holy grail that I spoke of, of 14 degrees C um, uh, earlier on. And you can see, although this trend over a hundred years is by no, no means a linear one, um, uh, nevertheless, we've been approaching that, that holy grail of 14 Celsius um, steadily over this period, such that we've just about reached it now. And I think that that's a strong reason why we've seen such a growth in the industry over the last 10, 20 years. It's because the growing environment has in some senses become more suited. The red circles here are highlighting the warmest uh, growing seasons, uh, April to October. The blue circles though are a reminder that we can still get shocks in the system. And certainly 2012 was, was not a good year uh, from that perspective. Next slide, please. Now, grapevine phenology um, reminds us that there are numerous points in the growing season where um, vines are particularly vulnerable to the uh, surrounding environment and the climate that we're experiencing. So we have periods like budburst and flowering and veraison and harvest, all of which are periods when the climate can do its worst and can affect production and quality. So we need to recognize therefore that there's a quite a strong degree of tailoring required in the analysis that we do. Just looking at the whole growing season as an average doesn't give us the whole picture of what the impacts might be. Next slide, please. And so recognizing that detail, we published a paper in 2018, um, which actually demonstrated using high resolution climate data, but also terrain information, slope, soil information, that kind of thing. We, we published a paper on viticultural suitability, the purpose of which was to identify where the most suited areas of the country are currently in the current climate for vine production. And so um, uh, we uh, recommend, uh, take a look at this paper if you'd like to see more of the details that we don't have time to go into in this presentation about land suitability for viticulture. Next slide, please. Now, this year, um, one of the biggest challenges has been that we had a couple of serious frost events. And so quality and yield have been affected this year um, by frost. And, and that can be a surprise because of course, over the years, over time, we're seeing fewer and fewer frost events um, af affecting us. But the problem is that of course, the vine phenology is also moving and changing as the climate itself is changing. 
So the industry remains vulnerable to these frost events. Next slide, please. And just to summarize the impact of the event. So on the right hand side here, you can see that during the period 11th to 15th of May this year, during the bud burst period, that we actually saw some of the coldest May temperatures experienced for in some regions of the country, the, the purple colors that you see on this map, 20, 30, or even 40 years since we saw such cold May temperatures. So even though the overall climate is becoming more suited, we, we get these uh, events that can still provide a shock to the system. Next slide, please. And uh, we were involved in some supporting an, um, a survey of uh, vineyard managers actually this year for just how much frost damage was experienced in their vineyards. And you can see in the middle of this slide at the top, the coloured bars, um, numbers of vineyards which were reporting uh, percentage damage to vines. And in some cases, um, some vineyards were reporting, 26 here, uh, we're reporting 80 to 90 percent of damage across the vineyard as a result of these frost events. Next slide please. So coming quickly then to how we've used data from HAD UK and from UK CPA team to help us with this analysis. Um, here I'm showing you on the left the ensemble mean UK CPA team growing season temperature April to October looking back at the period 1981 to 2000. And I want you to notice that the map on the left is, is remarkably similar, um, uh, reassuringly similar to the one in the middle, which represents HAD UK. Um, uh, you, you see the growing season temperatures matching very nicely, which provides us with good confidence of the performance of the UK CP18 ensemble in being able to realistically simulate what the growing season climate was in that 81 to 2000 period. But I really want to highlight on the right hand side how things have changed. So you see from HAD UK for 2009 to 18, the expansion of the region of the country showing, uh, showing the red colours. And remember, red 14 degrees or higher is that holy grail that I spoke about earlier. So suddenly the area suited to production for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir is expanding quite impressively. And the final slide, please, Declan. So we've been looking at that and projecting forwards and using the UK CP18 five kilometre data to look at the 2021 to 2040 period in particular. And so the graph at the bottom here is showing you the um, ensemble um, each of the ensemble members of UK CP18 for each year in that 2021 to 2040 period. And the data I'm showing here is for one particular vineyard shown on the map uh, above. And so this slide is merely to say that we are uh, in our analysis taking account of both the um, model variability from one ensemble member to another and also, of course, that critical interannual variability that I spoke about earlier. Um, and this is allowing us to tailor the advice and information that we're giving to vineyards, um, explaining to them what the interannual uh, variability looks like, but also not pinning our hopes purely on the ensemble mean or on one ensemble member, but looking at the impact of model variability for, for each particular vineyard area. And we'll be publishing a paper with all of these results that we've come up with and um, hopefully submitting in the next month. I'll hand over now to, um, to Kate. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Um, okay, and um, yeah, thanks for the slide, Declan. Um, so, I mean, obviously, as Steve has, has made clear, the geographical location of viticultural suitability windows are really changing remarkably quickly. Um, and, you know, as, as you said, many of the world's most established wine regions, you know, are regularly, well, they're even exceeding optimum temperatures for the varieties that they're known for. Um, 
From an adaptation perspective, um, literature shows that in these contexts, producers do take a lot of steps at vineyard and winemaking stages of production uh, to try to adapt to this. So um, in California's Napa Valley, for example, um, producers are regularly harvesting their crops earlier um, to try to preserve acidity levels and to prevent high alcohol concentrations. Um, but this literature also shows that there's really quite a high degree of lock-in in these systems that limits adaptive capacity. So old world wine regions particularly, <coughs> excuse me, are often defined by very specific uh, geographical and grape variety pairings, um, which are also instrumental to the way in which um, wines from these regions are marketed. Um, and so obviously this makes it even harder for producers to consider things like relocating vineyards, <coughs> excuse me, or growing alternative grape varieties as climatic conditions change. Um, in comparison, uh, the young and you know, very much less established landscape of the UK uh, means that UK producers are theoretically um, much freer to define the styles of their wines uh, to maximise the opportunities presented by a changing climate. If I could ask for the next slide, uh, please. Um, this, this, you know, this, it's this that really formed the basis of our first research question, where we wanted to know to what extent uh, the UK wine sector is integrating climate change into its development. Um, and then because existing literature on adaptation in viticulture has concentrated on the management of heat and droughts uh, through the UK sector, we also wanted to explore adaptation behaviour at the cool climate margin of viticulture. Um, within this, we focus particularly on how producers manage and plan for interannual variability, um, since this was identified um, as the biggest threat uh, of climate change by producers in, in earlier research that Alistair conducted. Um, and we also adopted a value chain lens, essentially recognising that, you know, private sector adaptation is inevitably influenced by broader business environments. Um, although for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus uh, mostly on producers. Could I have the next slide, please, Declan? <coughs> mm. Mm. So um, we first began by mapping the UK um, wine sector value chain. Uh, using a range of methods for this um, and then we refine this through in-depth interviews with uh, 29 respondents from along the value chain um, and these interviews covered topics like business history and strategy um, as well as perceptions and planning for climate change um, and we also asked about experience of extreme events um, and then we expanded our sample through a shorter online survey. Um, so this slide uh, is including a representation of the value chain um, and it identifies a range of actors uh, within the sector. Um, from this it's probably just most important to note that there are different types of grape and wine producer. So some are just growing grapes, uh, some are buying in grapes to make wine and some are doing a combination of these activities um, and sometimes using external providers of vineyard management um, or winemaking services. If I could ask for the next slide please Declan. Um, yeah, so, um, well, <clears throat> hopefully from this you'll be able to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, get a sense that we've really covered quite a lot of uh, different areas um, in our data set. Um, so I'm just going to try and cover some highlights. Um, probably a helpful starting point is to, uh, to note that, you know, belief in climate change is really very high across the wine sector. So this is actually a questionnaire um, item that we replicated from a nationally representative survey that was also conducted under the UK Climate Resilience Fund. Um, and what it shows is that belief in climate change is now very high across the UK, um, but seemingly almost universally so um, across the wine sector. Um, and on the next slide, uh, please, Declan, thank you. Um, we also observed uh, quite a notable shift in perceptions of risk and opportunity around climate change within the wine sector, even over just the last six years. So <clears throat> in 2014, when Alistair surveyed producers, they uh, very much predominantly saw climate change as a threat. Uh, whereas when we replicated this question in 2020, respondents viewed climate change as much more of an opportunity, predominantly as both a threat and an opportunity. Uh, next slide, please, Declan. So, um, I mean, from a producer perspective, the opportunities that were reported sounded uh, surrounded the ability to uh, ripen new types of grapes, produce new types of wine, um, and to do so where other areas of the world are struggling. Um, and the potential challenges of climate change perceived by informants particularly focused on interannual variability in climatic suitability um, and variability in yields, um, as well as um, the potential for an increase in extreme weather events. Um, next slide, please, Declan. Um, yeah, so with this, as well as both Declan and Steve have mentioned, you know, the sec sector is really growing rapidly. 
Um, and so an in, uh, encouraging finding was that um, we found producers are actually taking quite a lot of steps uh, to prepare for climate change right from vineyard establishment. Um, particularly producers are really recognizing the importance of getting the site and the variety right. Um, and they're often making use of consultancy services to support site selection uh, using downscaled climate information to assess site suitability, which obviously is, as Steve has indicated was, was a key motivation for some of the work under this project. Um, some established producers talked about diversifying their sites to limit exposure. So, for example, uh, planting or sourcing grapes um, in different counties. Um, and yeah, and this, this slide's um, focusing on grape growers, but we saw this kind of climate change planning at all stages of the value chain. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thanks, Declan. Um, so, uh, to understand how interannual variability interacts with adaptation, we asked respondents to describe their experiences and responses during both a good year and a bad year in the industry. Um, and as this slide shows, um, you know, 2018 was clearly singled out as an exceptional year for grape growing, while 2012 stood out as an unfavorable year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we first mapped uh, great growers' perceptions of what made uh, 2018 such a strong year from a climatic perspective. Um, and this echoes the types of characteristics that Steve mentioned. So things like an absence of spring frost um, and warm and dry conditions at key points in the grapes phenological development. Uh, and then on the next slide, um, we see, we, well, we also learned that essentially even a good year came with challenges. So things like uh, challenges processing the increased uh, volumes of grapes came up a lot. Um, and several growers actually reported being concerned about water stress and sunburn uh, on their vines for the first time. Um, and some producers uh, reported new challenges around um, preserving the typicity of their wines. Um, and there was also this longer term concern um, about performance of this year driving investment in the sector and ultimately contributing uh, to a fear of market saturation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we then uh, mapped um, the adaptation behaviours that we used to manage the opportunities and challenges of this good year. Um, I don't have time to run through these, but um, for example, uh, great growers describe things like adjusting pruning techniques and spraying regimes, um, and winemakers describe changes that they made to their use of additives and to the types of wines that they produced. Um, and on the next slide, um, we saw that in, in some cases, adaptation uh, decisions had uh, like direct impl uh, implications for other actors within the value chain. So things like impacting demand on um, or demand for inputs and services. So what we found was that other actors within the value chain also had to adapt to the changing conditions and the new opportunities and challenges within the sector. Next slide, please. Um, respondents. Um, also described ways in which 2018 contributed to their broader learning um, and shaped um, future climate risk and business management strategies. So things like investing in new business relationships or testing new varieties or products are things that respondents uh, described doing as a result of 2018. And this is the same when um, respondents uh, talked about their experience of a bad year as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so yeah, well, this slide is really just to show that this learning was also emphasised by participants uh, in terms of the sources of information that they reported relying on when planning for climate change. Um, so you can see here that dependence on own experience and experimentation um, within both the vineyard and winery was common to most producers. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so to try and sum up some of these findings a little bit, um, the way in which producers described responding um, to the climatic conditions that they experienced in 2018 and in also in 2012, um, shows that producers do make these ongoing adjustments to their production strategies in quite reactive ways. Um, but we've um, also found ways in which producers are integrating uh, longer term climate change planning and learning into business decision making too. Um, and alongside this strong dependence on personal experience and experimentation uh, to inform adaptation, uh, we found you know, producers are taking quite notable steps to integrate other forms of climate information into key decision-making processes. And on this, I would say, you know, the use of downscale climate information to select sites and grape varieties is a really particularly positive trend for the sector, um, since these are quite notable sites of lock-in um, in more established viticultural systems. Um, not least because of the cost of replanting and relocating vines. Uh, next slide, or last slide, please, Declan. Thank you. Um, this said, we're still seeing areas where the UK wine sector does risk reproducing some lock-in. 
Um, so firstly, I mean, people are still facing challenges identifying suitable sites and varieties, um, as well as clones and rootstock. So this quote um, from a vineyard owner illustrates this point when she's saying essentially, you know, I didn't have the right knowledge to ask for the right Chardonnay clones when I was planting. Um, but we've also um, identified a range of ways in which uh, producers are limiting their own flexibility uh, to adjust their production strategies in adaptive ways. Um, and what we found is this is usually emerging in spaces where producers are trying to respond to market pressures or they're trying to create unique marketable qualities in their wine, seemingly driven by this fear of, of market saturation. Um, so, for example, producers are often um, very committed to producing English sparkling wines through the classic champagne grapes of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. Um, and this is basically on the basis that it's these grapes uh, that consumers will purchase. Uh, but it's to an extent um, that they're often not interested in exploring other varieties that might have more attractive uh, qualities. Um, and you can also see some potential for locking converging around interests to develop protected designation of origin statuses. Um, so there's particular interest in uh, producing a PDO for Sussex, uh, where grapes could then only be sourced from Sussex. Um, and then there are some areas where regulations are starting to creep in um, with limits on yields or no use of um, additives in winemaking, um, which also have some potential implications for flexibility um, and adaptive capacity in production. So yeah, so these are some of the thoughts that have inter um, emerged from our interview and survey data set. So hopefully that's a nice segue to now hand over to Alistair and Francis from Vinescapes, who are very embedded within the sector and have a great deal of experience of managing these processes and trade-offs on the ground. 